All right, let's get started. Welcome to 6858. This is a class on computer system security. So just as some administrative before we dive in, um, that's a large class. There's a lot of you guys <laughs> that want to take this class, so that's cool. Uh, it's much better if you can ask questions. It makes the whole thing much more interactive and exciting. So feel free to ask questions at any time. It is kind of a large auditorium, so if you don't feel like shouting from the back or you don't want to ask the question yourself, we have a system set up that you can actually ask anonymous questions, and it'll buzz one of the TAs up front, and they'll ask your question for you. Uh, so if you go to the course website under Participate, you can find the link for that thing and type in questions and make the TAs do the work of asking it. Uh, so please ask questions, interrupt. Uh, that's great. Um, the other thing is we're trying to record video for these lectures and make it available online. The intention isn't really so much that you can participate completely online. I think the video might not be super high res, like maybe you can't quite make out what's on the boards, uh, but hopefully it's a good enough backup if you're not able to come to lecture someday. Uh, but uh, it's there if you need it, and might even be approximately live uh, if you need to access it. All the links are on the class website. So that's sort of some administrivia. Um, let's start talking about computer system security. So what do we mean by making computer systems secure? For the purposes of this class, what I mean by security is that the system is going to work, or the system works, despite some adversary. So we want the computer to keep working, or maybe keep our data private, uh, do something interesting for us, uh, and it should keep doing that correctly, even though there's a bad guy out there in the world trying to foil us. Um, so it's an interesting problem. It's an interesting sort of family of problems all across anything you might do with a computer. And uh, just to give you some sense of why this turns out to be an interesting or tricky kind of a problem, consider a simple example. So we might want to say that in our class, you know, maybe only the TAs can access the grades file. So maybe we stick it in AFS or in Dropbox, whatever. We have a grades file. We want to make sure only the TAs can access it. So usually, if you're faced with this goal, and your goal is to make sure that it positively works, the positive goal is relatively easy to check. The TAs can, in fact, access it. I can just ask. There's five TAs in this class. Hey, guys, can you try to pull up the grades file? Can you get it? And, uh, you know, test by the TAs. And we can check. Can they get the grades file? If so, good. The problem, or sort of the main challenge in security, is that it's a negative goal, meaning we're trying to make sure that only the TAs are going to be able to access this file. And this negative goal turns out to be tricky to achieve, mostly because it has to hold despite a whole bunch of adversaries that we might not even understand who they are trying to foil our plan to make the grades file accessible only through TAs. And there's many things you could imagine, right? So one thing is maybe there's a bug in the code. So an adversary just takes advantage of some mistake in our file server or in Dropbox's servers. So maybe there's a bug that allows us to bypass this plan or this security policy. Any other things? Like, okay, if you're faced with a goal of bypassing our security policy, what might you do? Yeah, back there. Yeah, like maybe just like bribe the TA, right? Fantastic plan, and it'll probably work. Sort of a question of how much, I guess. Any other guesses or suggestions? Lots of things you could do, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, so you could like maybe guess the password. Or I guess another possibility is maybe you don't know the password, but or maybe they use certificates and all, all great, but you could just like steal their laptop that has the password and the 
certificate on it, probably. There's probably other things to do, like maybe you can sniff the wireless network. Maybe if the TAs access the grades file from their laptop here, it's going over Wi-Fi. So maybe you can monitor Wi-Fi or other network links. You could probably do all kinds of things. Uh, sort of an endless list of things you have to worry about. And that makes this sort of a, in some ways, an ill-posed problem. Like, what the hell are we even trying to do? Is it okay to monitor Wi-Fi or not? Do we have to worry about bribing it? Do I have to pay them more now so they don't give out the grades? What's the deal? Like, I guess you could even, like, get a job at Dropbox to get the grades file. Right? Like, do I have to worry about vetting Dropbox employees? This is getting sort of ridiculous and a little bit out of hand. So this is sort of the reason why security turns out to be tricky to approach and often goes wrong. And in some sense, this argues that it's really important to have some coherent systematic plan for dealing with security because we can sort of have no end of discussion uh, trying to cook up various attacks and argue, is this good or bad? Do, is this worth fixing? So you really need some kind of a systematic plan to deal with security problems. And typically, the way that we think about security starts with some kind of a goal. So this is along the lines of what I proposed up there, that maybe what we want to make sure is that only Alice can access some file, some file F. So that would be great, but uh, unless we scope down this problem, we'll never succeed. There's always more and more elaborate attacks. So in order to make any progress here, you have to have what's called a threat model. So a threat model is just sort of a set of assumptions that you're making about the adversary, either because you believe the adversary couldn't possibly be that fancy or sophisticated, like maybe they can't break P equals NP, or they don't have a quantum computer, or maybe it's just a statement of fact about what you're willing to put up with as an adversary. Maybe if the government is after me, that's fine. It's like not that important to me to keep some secret against certain attackers, but you know, as long as it's a modest attacker, I want the security to hold up. So the threat model is your set of assumptions that you're gonna be making about who you're up against, who are these adversaries that are trying to foil your goal. And then once you sort of figured out what the uh, threat model is, for example, the bad guy cannot guess the TA password and maybe they can't bribe the TA, but they're able to monitor the wireless network and maybe they can find some bugs in the software, so we have to worry about that. So that's sort of an example of things you might worry about in a threat model. And then to actually figure out how to make a system get your goal <laughs> uh, satisfied, typically we talk about having some kind of a policy. So a policy you can think of as sort of a plan or a config for, for the system to actually meet the goal. So you can imagine maybe the policy is I'm going to set a bunch of file permissions. Like I'll set the permissions on grades.txt so that only the TAs supposedly can read it in the file system. That's like part of the story. There's probably more. Maybe part of my policy is also I'll require two-factor authentication for all the TAs. So just guessing their password isn't going to be enough. I have to steal their USB thingamajiggy. So that's sort of a policy. And typically, the other part of how you realize a security plan is what's called a mechanism. That's sort of the implementation, or the, the code, or the hardware, basically anything that actually implements the policy. So here might be, there's a file system like ext4 on Linux. This thing is implementing my files, and it's enforcing those permissions that I set. And maybe there's some kind of a logging system, sorry, login system like Kerberos, and its implementation is going to make sure that you do two-factor two authentication to get your Kerberos tickets to log in. Now, these things are sort of interchangeable. Oftentimes, these are layered, like the policy at one level is actually the mechanism at the next level up. Not super important, the differences between them. This is more sort of a, for a thought exercise. 
But the thing here that is kind of maybe more important is that these two things at the bottom are trying to realize your goal and threat model. And it's at least in principle possible to look at a policy and a mechanism and think hard and say, oh, well, it seems to be doing the job, or maybe there's some problem in this policy and mechanism, and my security is not being satisfied. These two things up there, goal and threat model, these things are fundamentally defining what you're trying to go after. So even though you might get the threat model wrong in some sense, it's hard to pin down that you were wrong. It's that you asked for the wrong thing to begin with. So it's possible for the policy and the mechanism to be buggy or incorrect. You can look at it. You can argue with someone. Look, I found a problem. Let's fix it, etc. This thing works. This thing doesn't. This stuff is like arguing about definitions or goals. You might just have a different goal in life about having a particular set of assumptions or a different top-level goal altogether. So even though we'll talk about various problems with threat models, it's a little bit hard to pin down a threat model as being wrong. Maybe that's all I'm trying to say here in a, any sort of a formal or precise way. Might be wrong because like, you didn't want that, but uh, it's hard to formalize that. Make sense? Any questions? You guys are being quiet. Feel free to type questions into this online thingy. You get the TAs to do something here. Anything unclear so far? All right, so I presented the systematic plan for you guys, goal, threat model, all this great stuff. Unfortunately, it's not really an answer to why security is hard. It's not like, oh, this is like the secret thing. No, everyone should have been following along and would have, we wouldn't have had all these security problems. That's a useful way to think of the world of security, but despite sort of me proposing a systematic plan, that's really hard to get right in practice. It's not like there's some secret missing here. It's just difficult to pin down what is exactly your threat model, what your policy is, even what your goal is. And as a result, it's hard to get right, and we have security problems. So it's easy enough to sort of say, well, you know, you should state your assumptions. What is your threat model? But in practice, it's hard to know what you should even ask for in a threat model or what happens to go right or wrong in real systems. So inevitably, what you have to do, in, realistically speaking, is to iterate. So you probably should start with some plan, some threat model, etc. But inevitably, you're going to have to monitor your system that's deployed out there and see what kinds of attacks you get. And you should sort of monitor the attacks and learn something from them. Like maybe your threat model was wrong. Or maybe it was too strong and no one's bothering to attack it in a certain way. Another thing that's worth doing is really using components that other people have figured out. So you shouldn't invent the world from scratch because it takes a lot of iterations to get it right. And you don't want to be doing those iterations if someone else has already done it. So this applies to like libraries you might use, whole sort of design principles. We'll look at various designs in later lectures. Uh, reuse as much as possible of things that actually worked well. Um, another sort of is uh, post-mortems are super important. What I mean by this is that inevitably, when something goes wrong in security, that's a really expensive lesson there, and it's worth learning from it. So it's worth understanding why various security failures happen and how they could have been avoided or whether you should just change your expectations and expect them to keep happening. So that's one sort of aspect of this. You have to have an iterative approach. But even on top of that, it's sort of unrealistic for security to always succeed, despite me sort of claiming some systematic plan here. And that's because as a defender, as I said, the goal is to have your system work despite any adversary that might come along. So you basically have to make sure your system works for all possible attacks, no matter what the bad guy figures out. And the job for the adversary is much easier. You just have to have one attack that works. So as long as you've thought of 
one attack that the bad guy missed. You're good as an attacker. Conversely, as a defense person, well, if you thought of 25 attacks and there was a 26th one that you missed, well, that's sort of as bad as not having done any of it, maybe. So that's a really hard job to defend a system in some sense if you set the goal of being perfectly secure. Luckily, it doesn't always have to be sort of all black and white, so I guess I want to argue that even though we're not going to get it exactly right, it's still useful. So even though we might have imperfect defenses, it might still be a good idea to think about security. And at a high level, it's not black and white because someone has to actually go out and attack your system for some purpose. Uh, so one way you might think of it is that you want to make sure that the attack cost for the bad guy to go and try to break into your computer system uh, should be bigger than whatever the value is that they get out of your computer. So that's one way to try to imagine it. It's really messy to try to figure out what these costs and values actually are, but roughly speaking, you could probably try to approximate this in various application domains, and uh, even though my computer isn't sort of perfectly secure, I imagine lots of you could, you know, walk up and steal it, etc. Um, you know, I'm sort of okay with my life, and I can keep using that computer. So you don't have to have sort of perfect defenses even in order for things to be uh, useful security-wise. Another way to think of security is that uh, maybe the bad guy will come along and attack other systems. So this is true for sort of broad attacks, like sending spam or collecting a botnet. If the bad guy doesn't really care whose computers they compromise, they just want to compromise a million machines or send a million messages of spam, then they don't really care whose machine they break into. And it's kind of like the joke about outrunning the bear. If there's a bear after you, you don't have to run faster than the bear, you just have to run faster than someone else. So this is roughly one mindset you could have about uh, securing your computer systems here. And I should say, uh, sort of in this intro lecture, we're going to look at holistically at what problems show up in computer security and what makes it hard. But much of the actual class is going to look at techniques that have big payoff. So the overall costs and values on whatever of a system are very application specific. Like the value of my laptop might be different than the value of someone else's laptop. But what we're going to talk about in this class is not looking at specific machines with some bugs in them, but we're going to look at big techniques that actually significantly improve the security at a relatively low cost. So that's going to be the reason to get excited about security is that there's a bunch of cool stuff we can do, a bunch of cool stuff people have looked at and made work that really improve security by big leaps. So we'll look at a bunch of research papers and case studies of real systems in this class that hopefully give you ideas for things you could do in systems that you're going to be building in the future. And many of these techniques that we're going to be looking at are actually going to enable functionality or features that you might care about. So things, of, things like VPN, you can you know, connect to a remote network and not worry about it. It's like a security thing that enables you to do stuff you couldn't do before. Or sandboxing for code, like JavaScript or WebAssembly in your browser. That really makes it possible to do cool stuff that you wouldn't have been able to do without these security mechanisms. And maybe the last thing I want to mention is an analogy between this world of computer security and physical security as well. So in the physical world, we also have imperfect defenses. Sure, any one of you can break into my house. There's a window. You can get a brick, break it in. No problem. Uh, but the things that make it difficult in the real world is deterrence, which is often what's missing in computer security. It's a little bit hard to track down who did what on an open network. That's one big difference is accountability and deterrence is hard to do in computers. The other is the cost of attacks. So in a physical world, you've got to actually be somewhere to do some attack. You've got to go to my house and break a window. In computer security, you can use computers to lower the cost of attacks dramatically. So that's another huge difference about computer security versus real-world security, which is that uh, 
really hard to drive up the cost of a tax in certain ways. But uh, sort of maybe a attempt to make it seem not so depressing that we can't get perfect security. <laughs> All right, question over there. Yeah, so I guess the question is like, you know, in some domains you don't have the option of iterating if you're securing a, you know, a military facility or a missile launch site, etc. Um, so I think we know a bunch of good ideas for making things secure. I think where you see the big trade-offs and the big complications are when you want security and a lot of sharing or a lot of functionality. If you want to secure a nuclear missile site, first approximation should like disconnect it from the network and then don't use Wi-Fi. That'll get you so much more secure right off the bat. And then, okay, you should make sure like, you know, eventually you install a computer that someone doesn't backdoor the software that gets shipped to that remote location, all this stuff. But there's like, you know, huge swaths of attacks we can rule out. What it does come with is restrictions. So if you want strong isolation, well, you have to be prepared to actually drive to that site to talk to the computer because it's not on the internet. So I think there's really sort of big ideas we have for strong guarantees, but it's hard to reconcile it with wanting like a nuclear launch app on my iPhone. That is just, well, you know, you sort of laugh and, you know, it is a joke, but uh, in other contexts, these are not jokes, right? Like you, you have, you know, autonomous vehicles that aren't internet connected or you have airplanes that also have internet connected networks on them. And these engineers, well, there's good reasons why those are the requirements perhaps, and the engineers work hard, but I think what you often see is a conflict between wanting convenience, usability and sharing, and also strong isolation and security guarantees on the other side. And at some level it hmm, becomes, someone's gotta decide, what do you care about, security or sharing? So, Um, so I think a policy is something that is reasonably concrete. Like, here's how I'm going to go implement this. Um, I don't really know what a design spec is. To me, it, uh, I could imagine a design spec being a goal. Like, oh, I want a system where people can read, protect their files. Or maybe if a design spec is kind of like, a, I don't know, an object model in 6170 terms or something, then maybe it is kind of like a policy. Um, I don't mean to be super prescriptive with this kind of a systematic plan. I think it's more to break down the important parts. You have to have a, some goal you have in mind. You must have assumptions about the bad guy. This is the stuff that you usually don't have in other software engineering. And then there's something about how do you get there. Usually it ends up being split in some kind of a config setting plan and some implementation, but that's not that important. Another question? I, uh, yeah, so how do you empirically measure payoff? How do you know that something had payoff? Well, a bunch of the papers we're going to look at in this class, I guess I should say, right? the class basically has two parts. We're going to read a bunch of papers, one paper per lecture, roughly speaking. You guys should read it ahead of time, and we'll discuss it in lecture. The lecture is mostly going to be discussing things around the paper, um, and maybe less so the exact paper itself, to give you some context, to understand what was good about this paper, what's bad, what actually works well, etc. But then I think it's just empirically, you know, a bunch of stuff has been deployed. JavaScript works in your browsers, TLS works, certificates sometimes work. Um, so we have a bunch of ideas about what seems to work. We know how well mobile apps do or don't work on smartphones. So it's sort of the, you know, lesson learning from past mistakes. That's how we know that something seems to be a good idea or not. Yeah. All right, thanks for making Kevin ask questions. All right, other questions? All right, so let's talk about, I guess, trying to start thinking in this way of attacks and uh, what you can do to bypass the guarantees of a system. And I'm gonna try to break it down in roughly sort of things that go wrong in this systematic plan. So we'll talk about various ways that past systems have gotten threat models wrong, They've gotten policies wrong, implementation mechanisms wrong, 
And this is just to start you thinking about this adversarial way of understanding a system's design. And uh, it's also fun to see you know, case studies or sort of little snippets of how past systems have failed, uh, hopefully in a way that you won't make quite the same mistakes. All right, so let's start with policies. So these are sort of high-level plans that just were sort of not a great plan to begin with. It doesn't matter what code you write, what assumptions you make, it's just the plan wasn't that great. And my most actually favorite example in this space, very pithy, is um, an airline, I won't name which one, uh, was implementing business class airfare. These are tickets that you pay a lot of money for, and you can change them anytime you want. Like, you change your mind, I want to go to this business meeting next week instead of this week. No problem, you can change the ticket anytime you want. That's sort of the usual rule, or the way it was. And it turns out this policy was not a great plan for some airline. So some customer figured out that they can buy a business class ticket, and uh, what they would do is, They'd get on the airplane, and before it takes off, they'd pull out their phone and change the ticket, and change it to a ticket next week somewhere else. But they're already on the plane, so they get to wherever they're going. And then they get there, they can get on the plane again, and before it takes off, they change the ticket again. So it took a while for this airline to notice that this passenger was flying a lot on the same ticket. And in fact, they didn't even have quite the checks to prevent this. So at some level, this fundamental policy of allowing a ticket to be changed any time was already flawed. So in order to fix this, of course, what they did is they actually had to change their boarding gate systems to update the reservation record and say that once you've boarded an airplane, that's it. You can't change the ticket anymore. And uh, as an example, right, so, so just changing a policy might mean you have to all of a sudden change the software running on these boarding gates, and some of them weren't internet, connect internet connected before. So you have to really connect them now. That's a complicated plan, maybe, to change, to make a seemingly simple change to a policy. But nonetheless, you have to really think through all the effects that you're asking for in a policy design. Another example that I like is uh, a policy of a school system. Um, this was from Fairfax County in Virginia. Um, this is a fairly standard school system for, I think it was a high school um, they have in a system they have a bunch of students taking classes. All the students have their own files that they can access for their homeworks, what have you. And uh, there's teachers that are actually teaching the classes. They also have their own files. And uh, there's a class. So, you know, teachers teach a class. A class has a bunch of students in it. Fairly standard thing. And then there's a, a guy on the side, a principal of sorts who is in charge of the whole thing, like a director of the whole school, and they have access to all the files. So that's roughly the setup. This is kind of the policy, if you will. There's one extra wrinkle, which is that the students weren't being very diligent with their passwords. They kept forgetting them. So the school system said, ah, we have a solution. We'll let the teachers help the students change their passwords. The teachers know who the students are. So if you're in a class, you can go to the teacher and... Uh, Ask them to change your password. The teacher knows who you are. They can authenticate you, let you enter a new password. No problem. And there was another feature, which turned out to conflict, which is that teachers could effectively you know, approve add drop forms on the spot. So if you wanted to add a class, you just go to a teacher, they add you to the class, no problem. So now the question is, how bad is it if some teacher's password gets compromised? Well, this turns out to have been pretty bad. So some student discovered that they got the password of one teacher, I forget which class it was. They got the teacher's computer. They added the principal as a student of that class. And then they used the teacher's computer to then change the password of the principal because they were a student in the class. And now they had access to all the files in the school. So, so you know, all these combinations of policy decisions didn't work out so well. Um, not entirely clear what the right fix is. I mean, at some, I don't know, many of these things are questionable decisions in the policy, you could argue, but uh, the end result is particularly damaging, or was in this particular case. Make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah, so a question from Kevin from some anonymous student. How do you empirically validate some claim like WebAssembly isolation, JavaScript isolation? I think uh, there's a lot of techniques that you might use. So one is a lot of bug finding techniques. You could take a WebAssembly or JavaScript, like a browser running JavaScript or WebAssembly in one domain, and you could fuzz it with random inputs and see if you can escape. You could, um, for example, hire a bunch of smart people to analyze your system. This actually happens a lot in a security space. These are called red teams or penetration testers. Their job is to you give them a system design and they try to figure out how to break it. Uh, so that's one way. Um, there's some research that's somewhat getting deployed on formal verification where you use some mathematical tools to look at a piece of code like maybe a JavaScript sandbox or a WebAssembly sandbox in your browser. And you make sure that that code correctly isolates WebAssembly so that you can't escape. Even if you have malicious code running in your browser in one tab, the mathematical proof about the code of the browser tells you, huh, you can't escape. Now, that, that particular thing is a bit of a research vision yet, far away, but, uh, or I don't know how far, but not deployed yet. But these are various things you could try to do to make sure that things are working well. For widely deployed things, I guess you could just Google and see if things have been breaking there. That's one empirical measure, but it's fairly approximate, kind of a, for low cost attacks, you can see if someone's found a really cheap way to break it. There's of course maybe some attacks that aren't so publicized yet. Another question, Kevin? You know, maybe. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a situation where the student forgot their phone at home but needs to access their homework. So you'll need some way to bypass the two-factor off or maybe the teacher needs to be able to get the two-factor code for the student. Um, these are all sort of situations. One thing I guess we'll talk about in a second, but the place where most policy problems happen is not really on the common case side. So many of the policy problems really happen in corner cases where you worry about things like administration, or maintenance, or operations. Maintenance. So, the things to, the places where you should really look for policy problems isn't the common case, like, oh yeah, everything's working well, is the policy uh, preventing me from accessing grades.txt. What you should really be looking at is all kinds of corner cases for how to manage the system, all these exception cases. So, like, what if you have to change a password? This is the thing that went wrong in the school system. But uh, someone suggested two-factor auth. Well, if you introduce two-factor auth, you'll have a problem of someone losing their phone or changing their phone number. So how do you reset the two-factor thing? Or you have a lost phone. You have to worry about that. Who has access to backups? You'll have to have backups of your data. It's going to be on some computer. Who has access to the computer with the backups? Who gets to configure how often the backups run? Maybe you can change the backup destination and you can say, oh yeah, my laptop is gonna house the backups for the school district. You know, so someone, there's some config there out there somewhere that says where the backups go. You better make sure that that is securely set. So all these corner cases are super important. Like how do you revoke users or how do you, you know, who gets to control the audit logs or who gets to install the software or software updates to begin with? So all these sort of management meta-level questions, which you think of as, like, they're not interesting in the common case, they're super interesting from a security perspective. Like, how does the system get to its configuration state to begin with? How do you arrange everything? How do you worry about exception cases? That's where many of the policy problems show up. Oftentimes there's not a great answer, right? Like, for resetting two-factor, your plan was to have two-factor codes, so, someone doesn't have their two-factor code, you're not gonna have a great answer to that problem. You're gonna have to rely on some administrator. Maybe the administrator is not trustworthy, like this teacher in this example. These are where the problems are. Make sense? Any other questions? Good for now. All right, thanks for the questions, keep them coming. All right, so that's one example. Um, I wanted to give you another example of a policy failing uh, it's a, it was a particularly dramatic failure of password reset policies. 
or sort of generally a count reset. So this is a, you know, you have lots of stories we could use here. The most exciting one I know of is about a guy called Matt Honan. He was a reporter for Wired magazine, probably like five or six years ago at this point. Um, someone was trying to get into their Gmail account. So he had a Gmail account. They tried to reset the password so that they could get in. Question is, what does Gmail do when you ask it to reset the password of your account? Well, at least at the time, what happened was that Gmail said, yeah, I'll send a reset link to your backup email address. And the backup email address, you know, to the backup address, for this guy was some Apple service, me.com. All right, so the bad guy got Gmail to send the reset link to me.com. Can you get into the guy's account here? Well, if you want to reset your Apple iCloud account, at least at the time, what you had to supply to Apple was the last four digits of your credit card number. All right, so the bad guy doesn't have that yet either. But there's more steps to the story. The guy, Matt Honan, the victim in our case, had an Amazon account. And uh, the bad guy wanted to reset the guy's Amazon account, see if there's anything useful there. Well, how do you reset the guy's Amazon account? Well, in order to reset the Amazon account, you, it'll also send an email to the backup address. Well, we're kind of back to where we started, except now we can, tr turns out Amazon had some interesting features. Always a start of a problem story. Um, you could change your password at Amazon. So what if you want to change your password? Turns out, uh, sorry, if you want to change your email. Turns out some people at Amazon, uh, like users of Amazon, sometimes they just want to buy stuff, but they've changed their email account, but they want a shopping history back associated with their new email address. Even though like my Comcast email address went away, I have a new one, I call them up on the phone, I say, hey, I'm Bob, I got the same account, but my email address is now something else. Well, their policy is actually, yeah, you can change the email address for an Amazon account. You have to have the full credit card number. So that's a bit problematic. But here's sort of where this whole web starts to unravel. There's a final interesting operation on Amazon. You could buy stuff. And Amazon was really interested in letting you buy stuff, even if you're not logged in. Now, of course, it would be bad if I could log into Kevin's Amazon account and buy a bunch of, I don't know, notebooks or whatever, and have it shipped to somewhere. But Amazon said, ah, if you're shipping to a new address, you gotta supply a new credit card number. So they figured, no worries, because you're just buying something. If it's with a new credit card, there's no real harm in letting you not authenticate. I'll just claim to be buying this under Kevin's account, but I'm supplying the credit card, I'm supplying everything. Why not allow this? This is where Amazon started to go wrong. So the bad guy in this story bought some minor goods on Amazon with his own credit card under Matt Honan's, the victim's account. And they said, oh yeah, save this credit card number in Matt's account. This wasn't a problem in terms of leaking the credit card number. This is a bad guy's credit card number. But now he could go back here and say, oh yeah, I know the credit card number. Actually, I just added it. I can change the email. Then you could reset the password because now the backup email address goes to the adversary's choice of email addresses. I can get access to Amazon's account for Matt Honan. Turns out you could also list the saved credit card numbers. And uh, you know, one of them is the one the bad guy just planted. The other one was the real credit card that the guy had that was also at Apple. It only listed actually the last four digits of the credit card number on the website to not leak it, but actually that's all that Apple needed as it turns out. You only need the last four digits of your number to reset your Apple account. And then the bad guy took over his Gmail account. So listen to the story, aside from being maybe sort of a surprising example of how things unravel, uh, is that often attacks really piece together lots of different pieces. So we'll sometimes in this class look at simple attacks where, ah, it's like one and done. We found the bug, it directly leads to a problem, done. But in the real world, often attacks are actually sort of many steps put together. So here, it took a combining things from a bunch of accounts to really break into this Gmail account. In many cases, taking advantage of various software vulnerabilities, 
requires finding the right combination of bugs, exploit them in the right way. That's tricky stuff. And it's often, because often attacks require piecing together many different parts of a story, it might be difficult for the developer of any one part of a system to realize that this is a real problem. Because, you know, Apple thought they had a good plan. Gmail thought they had a good plan. I mean, probably Amazon is the most to blame here. This seems like a questionable feature here. But really, all these things fitting together break in more ways than you might have expected looking at each one of them. So that's, I think, one important lesson is that it's, it's part of the reason why I think it's often hard to understand or appreciate security problems up front because you might not realize how many things are, are out there the bad guys could combine and put together. I mean, this is in terms of credentials, but also in terms of bugs, in terms of bad assumptions, etc. Kevin? How to consider security of interconnected components? Yeah, I don't know, man. That's tough. <laughs> I think you'd be tough pressed to really sort of predict this kind of stuff ahead of time if you hadn't seen it before. I think as we will talk a bit about threat models, I think it's important to really pin down what it is that you're assuming about yourself, your component, and the other components. So might be useful for all these site services. It's a little bit, uh, not, not really my place to criticize these guys. These guys actually build a large website. I'm just teaching about it, so I don't know. Like, I, I shouldn't be telling these guys what to do, of course. But you could imagine maybe they should have sat down and carefully spelled out, oh, well, my security depends on either the guy knowing his password or knowing the last four digits of the card card number. And this is why I think the last four digits are actually a good thing. And like maybe if someone pushed them, like is that actually a good assumption? You might realize actually it's like printed on every piece of receipt you throw out. Maybe that's not a good thing. Um, so I think just making things explicit often helps appreciate what the dependencies are. We'll look at some threat model bugs later on. Um, but uh, I think being explicit and maybe experience are the big things here. Any questions back there? I saw some hands, maybe. Kevin. Does everyone does anyone get held liable for being insecure? Almost always, no. This is why security doesn't really matter. Yeah. I don't really have any great examples off the top of my head of anyone being seriously held liable for security failings. I think the places where this has happened the most is probably in the financial sector where some company lost money as a result of some computer attack. So there's been some attacks where the bad guys steal some credit card numbers or social security numbers or account numbers and actually steal people's money. There you can actually say, oh yeah, I lost, I don't know, $20,000, $5 million, $50 million, whatever. Um, and then you could actually tell, oh, yeah, like, you're an idiot. You, you, had the, you like misconfigured it for years and years and that's why I lost millions of dollars then you could sue them. So there's some cases of lawsuits against companies that really had grossly misconfigured systems and led to financial loss, but that's like about the only case where it matters. If they lose your data, it's hard to pin down how much it's worth and yeah. Had a question back there? Yeah, this seems the most dubious, yeah. It's kind of a fun example, but yeah, like uh, if, if I had to blame someone, I'd blame Amazon, yeah. But, uh, you know, okay, so, so Amazon is sort of the most questionable here. And I should say, like, you know, there's many business decisions here. Maybe, maybe they would still stick by this plan. I don't know. But Apple is also kind of dubious, right? Like, every receipt you throw out has your last four digits of a credit card on it. What the hell is Apple thinking also? You know, I'm sort of criticizing them in jest. Like, you know, I'm sure these are smart people that got to this in some way. I think it's more speaks as to the difficulty of getting this stuff right, as opposed to them not thinking carefully. But, uh, yeah. Make sense? Question? I, I don't think Amazon does this anymore. I mean, another thing I should say, as a preface, we're gonna teach you a bunch of stuff in this class. Don't necessarily run home and try this out. Uh, you know, I don't think Amazon does this, but I wouldn't recommend trying to mount an attack like this. Uh, MIT has some rules of use for the network you should read. We have a link on the class website. If you're ever in doubt about anything, come talk to us. 
but uh, I guess, yeah, this, this stuff has real-world consequences and uh, some things that you should poke at and try that are maybe harmless. Other things you should be careful about. Don't get in trouble. Yeah? If you make a mistake and you're put on a no-flight no, no flight list, yeah, that would be a mistake. Um, uh, yeah, so, so please, uh, you know, if you're ever in doubt, don't, don't do things. Uh, so we give you a VM that you can experiment with in your VM. You can do whatever you want there. I'm pretty sure that's safe. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll learn about various ways to take advantage of bugs in web applications. We give you a web application in your VM to play with. Play with it there. Uh, <laughs> You could also probably find these bugs pretty easily in real applications too, but uh, you know the, the world's changing, right? It used to be the case that uh, you wouldn't get sued for this stuff. Eh, it sort of depends on where we are, and maybe as MIT students, people cut you some slack. I don't know, but it's hard to predict, and uh, you know, don't get in trouble. Uh, you know, play with stuff in your own VM to the extent possible, and uh, chat with us. Don't get on no-fly lists. I mean. Uh, Somewhat of a joke, but somewhat not, right? Like, this stuff is, can get you in trouble, seriously. All right. Any other sort of questions about this policy angle? So one last meta-level, oh, yeah, question. Yeah, so with Amazon, the uh, website had a feature where you could uh, try to buy some goods and it would ask you, what's your email address? Well, where should we like, send the receipt? Or where, what, which account should we put this under? But as long as you're not using the saved credit card in that account, you didn't actually have to give the password for the account. You could just say, oh, yeah, I'm buying these you know, pencils. It's Nikolai's email address. Here's a new credit card. Why do I have to give you a password? I'm just like buying pencils, man. And they indeed implemented that feature. All right, so the last meta level point I want to make about policy mistakes separate from them being these kinds of, you know, metal level management corners, is the importance of defaults. So any computer system that you're going to deploy is going to be a large thing, running lots of things. You're going to be running Linux, lots of Linux things, Windows machines, switches, routers, all kinds of stuff going on that's much more complicated in some ways than any particular application you're likely to build on this large infrastructure. And the problem is, there's a lot of settings in the systems you're gonna be building on. There's like passwords for various management interfaces, there's permissions on millions of files in my Linux machine. There's like lots of files in my Linux machine. I don't know what the permissions on all of them are. I didn't, inst I need to put them there myself. I just like installed Arch Linux. And there, one conclusion from this is like hugely important that the default permissions, default settings on things are secure. So some examples of where this is not the case is, for example, default passwords in routers. So if you get a router for your you know, internet connection from Comcast or something, I think Comcast is better now, but uh, used to be a problem, and I think still a problem for other ISPs. You get a router at home, it has a default password, like username is admin, password is admin. You can log in, get started. And many times, you don't even know this thing is there that needs to be changed. You just plug it in, it works, done. But there's a setting, and the default is bad. And the problem is, unless you know that this setting is there, you're not going to know to change it. And because security is this negative goal, you have to enumerate all these attacks that you don't even know about. I didn't even know, maybe, that there was a password to be set in my router. Another example is lots of, uh, for example, permissions. You know, permissions on my laptop probably don't matter very much. You know, it's not like it's a multi-user Linux machine like an Athena dial-up machine is. But other permissions do matter. So, for example, the default permissions in Amazon's S3 service. So S3 is the storage service that Amazon lets lots of companies build on. So if you want to dump a bunch of PDF files in the web or things to download, or like almost any data. Pretty standard these days to dump it in an Amazon S3 service bucket or whatever. And other companies, Google, Azure, they all have similar services. When you're going to dump some data into S3, 
it's going to have some permissions on it. And it's really disastrous that sometimes these default permissions are world readable. Because you might be thinking, oh yeah, I'm just dumping some data, it's my data. Why do I even have to worry about permissions? You might not even realize there are permissions to be thinking about. But if the default is world readable, it's going to be really bad if you didn't think about it yourself. And there's been lots of security incidents where some company put a bunch of data in Amazon's S3 service thinking, oh, it's like our private, you know, file storage thing. Turns out it's not, and the default is world readable, and the result is all your data is public now. So crucially important whenever you're building some infrastructure that other people are going to use, that you make the defaults be as secure as possible. Basically, the way to think of it is, if someone never realizes there was a setting to be set, it should be fine that they didn't set it. Now, it's not the case with default passwords and routers being well-known. It's not the case with default file permissions in S3 being publicly readable. I mean, these things are mostly fixed now. Many router manufacturers are changing this. all good, but... These are examples of where it's absolutely crucial to get the defaults right when someone's going to be building on your infrastructure. Make sense? Questions? All right. So those are sort of some examples about policy problems. So now let's talk a bit more about, I guess let's do threat models. So various assumptions you might make that turn out to be not so great assumptions to be making. <clears throat> so, how do you mess up your threat model? So, maybe one thing I want to mention about threat models is uh, it's important to figure out, well, let's see. Common sort of interesting class of threat model failings has to do with cooking up secret designs. So it's not uncommon for you to see some system and you know you ask someone, oh, why is the system secure? Well, the assumption, or sort of if the answer is well, the innards are really complicated and no one can figure out how it works. The sort of implicit assumption is, well, we're assuming the bad guy will never figure out how this thing is working. One prominent historical example of this was a cryptographic system called the Clipper chip from, I think, the 90s that the government was pushing, saying, uh, so the, the story was the government thought encryption was not a good thing for people to be using. They're going to give everyone this chip that was going to encrypt data for you. And it'll be great, except the government can always decrypt it if they wanted to. And they didn't want to tell anyone how it works. It was just like, trust, put this chip in, it'll be great. Only we will look at your data if need be. And uh, separate from this being a questionable sort of plan, the implicit assumption here was that the design was the thing that was going to make this secure. No one's allowed to look at the design. And it turns out, in this case, uh, it turns out the design was kind of bad. Once people reverse engineered the design, they found all kinds of problems with it. And uh, separate from, again, this being maybe a questionable thing to begin with, of you know, having this escrow system where the government monitors all the communication, the problem with this kind of a threat model that the bad guy will never understand your design is that it is extremely difficult to recover from. So if your threat model is the bad guy doesn't know your encryption key or the bad guy doesn't know your password, you know, you might be proven wrong. Maybe they figure out your password or key, but it's easy to fix. Get a new key or change your password. If they figure out your design, and your whole plan was the design was going to stay secret, you are now in big trouble. Because now you have to cook up a new secret design. And it can't really be like the old secret design, because that was not so secret anymore. And if you only change it a little bit, the bad guy will figure it out, probably. So that's kind of an assumption, often called uh, security by obscurity. It's a term you'll probably see. Um, Kind of a risky assumption to be making because it's hard to recover from if it turns out you're wrong. So that's one sort of important thing to know about threat models. You want to be able to iterate, which means you want to be able to recover from mistakes about your assumptions. Another important class uh, is uh, user behavior. 
So a lot of security depends on users doing things right with passwords and credentials, right? But, you know, email phishing exists, and uh, it's often difficult to expect your users to behave exactly right, exactly according to some plan, and they might get confused and accidentally type their password into the wrong website. And, uh, you know, we had this question earlier, why not use two-factor authentication? So you've got to type in some code from your authenticator app or whatever into your website to log in. And, you know, two-factor auth is pretty good. It's an improvement. But even for two-factor code, it turns out that uh, the bad guys have figured out how to get them. They call you up on the phone. So there turns out to be a fairly active market for getting people's two-factor codes. And a pretty common attack strategy there is to call up the person on the phone and say, oh, we're from your bank, and, uh, you know, we need to check this transaction. Uh, you know, give us your code to authenticate you. And the problem is that usually you know, maybe if you're sophisticated, that on the website you know to look at the URL bar. But on the phone, there's no URL bar. You can't even know who you're talking to on the phone. So unless you're very careful and you're thinking, ah, they called me. How do I know who this is? So unless you're very careful about trying to understand who you're talking to, you might not realize that this might not be the bank you're expecting. And they might be able to get your code, and then on the back end, from there, and type it into the real website and log in as you. So nothing is, well, many of these uh, authentication schemes are reliant to varying degrees on the users doing the right thing. And we'll look at various designs actually next week for two-factor schemes that might be more or less resili resilient against various attacks of this kind. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're probably going to be making some big assumptions about what your users are doing. And uh, it's a slightly depressing area of computer security uh, because it's often hard to do much about it. Uh, but to some extent, it's possible to cook up designs that maybe assume less about users. Uh, it's harder to do the wrong thing. Those are really nice designs. We'll look at some examples in later lectures. Make sense? All right. So that's one example of a couple of examples of threat models and what you might get wrong there. Another sort of way you might go astray in thinking about threat models is really pinning down very specific attacks or very specific ways you expect the bad guys to attack your system. And my favorite example there of really assuming a very specific attack is uh, CAPTCHAs. So CAPTCHAs, you've probably seen, uh, you try to log into some website, and they give you some funky code, 3W, X, Z, 4, in the form of an image with some junk, and your goal is to type it in, 3W, X, Z, 4. And the goal of this mechanism, if you haven't thought much about it before, typically the reason people do this is to sort of cheaply, hopefully, prevent automated attacks. So prevent lots of spam being sent by a computer because you've got to be a human to try to enter these codes. So the goal, roughly speaking, of many of these systems is to prevent automatic spam. Or various spam-like things where the question is really volume, not whether some attack goes through. And the reason many people were excited about this capture mechanism initially is they were thinking, man, this is great. It is really difficult to implement the OCR, optical character recognition algorithms, to read this text. That's probably still the case, actually. I think it'll probably take you a bit of time to implement the right algorithms, learning models, whatever, to learn those CAPTCHA images. And each side is going to be different. Maybe they change up their color scheme, and all of a sudden, you need to retrain your recognition model. So that's all well and good. That's all actually a completely sensible assumption, except for the fact that the bad guy don't have to actually use OCR. What the bad guys figured out is actually it's much cheaper to just use humans. So there's a fantastic study from some researchers in San Diego where they looked at how do bad guys actually deal with these captures. And the answer is they actually have a whole bunch of workers in third world countries that sit at a computer all day long and solve captures. 
for some fraction of a cent per capture. So if I want to solve a thousand captures, I go to a website, I get a thousand images, I ship them to the service. They ship it to their outsource center, and uh, some person solves the captures. Turns out these guys are actually much better at solving captures than average humans. The guys sometimes make mistakes. Those guys never make mistakes. They know exactly what's in the image. They're extremely accurate. Um, so this is an example where you have to be really careful about not overly constraining how you think the bad guy is going to attack. Here it turns out, it's actually not that expensive to just hire humans to solve this stuff for you. And it doesn't make the defense completely useless, right? It still does something. It still requires going finding a human to solve this capture. So it still makes spam somewhat expensive, slightly. Maybe not as much as you were hoping, though. So bad guys can be pretty creative. Make sense? Questions about these examples? All right. So let's look at another example. Um, so another sort of, this is now, now more to, much more sort of systems-y problems you could uh, have wrong assumptions about. Um, this is a, many examples where you might misassume that your computer is running the expected software. I mean, this is a pretty natural assumption to be making. I'm going to write some software. I'm going to run it. My software is going to make some security checks. My software is going to be carefully written. That'll be the end of the story. But a big assumption I'm making there is that some computer I care about actually runs my software. That turns out to be not always the case. So one example of this that I know of from a little while back was uh, the Defense Department in the U.S. was interested in the 80s in building really secure operating systems. So they had actually a bunch of researchers build various prototypes of secure operating systems, and they went so far as to actually get red teams, so like red experts from the military, to come out and look at some prototype secure operating system written by some academics and try to break in. So here was a computer running this fantastic secure operating system, and uh, the red team was tasked, well, you know, go figure out how to break in. Turns out for a number of, at least one that I know of, of these computer systems, what the red team figured out is that, well, maybe the secure operating system is good or not, but turns out what's going on is that the researchers behind the scenes, they have some other computer which stores their source code. You know, these days, it'll be GitHub, but uh, there's some source code repo where the researchers store their operating system source code, and then every once in a while they, you know, they compile it and install it on the secure machine. So instead of breaking it in, what they did was just broke into the source code repo and changed the source code to let them log in. Next time the researchers deployed this code, well, there it is. They just logged in after the researchers installed the back door themselves. So it's important to really think about where all your software is coming from. And this stuff shows up over and over. Another maybe more recent, maybe easier to sort of appreciate problem showed up in mobile apps. So on your iPhone, there's lots of apps running. And the question is, where do these apps come from? So one part of the story, I mean, there's like a long laundry list of explanations of where do apps come from. Um, one part of the story is that the developer takes the app code, they use Apple's development tools, they compile the app, and they ship it to Apple, which ships it to your phone. So the relevant things for this example is that, you know, there's again source code, and the developer takes the source code and actually, in this case, uses Apple's Xcode tools, which is their, you know, compiler for iPhone apps, to actually compile and ship it to all people's phones in the world. They gotta get this Xcode thing somewhere. And this Xcode thing turns out to be like a giant thing. It's like gigabytes of a giant compiler. I don't know why. That's a, it's a large piece of software. And it turns out that in China, this download of this gigabyte-sized Xcode thing was super slow. And some enterprising Chinese attackers figured out, ah, we're going to set up the really fast 
Xcode mirror in China. And all the Chinese developers said, oh, fantastic. I'll just download Xcode from this Chinese mirror. It's much faster than going to Apple.com. Turns out the attacker planted a bug in this Xcode copy so that whenever you compiled an app with this backdoor Chinese Xcode, there was a bug inserted into the resulting app binary. And a whole bunch of apps that had developers outsourced to China and actually many other countries too ended up with bugs in their apps, even though the source code was great. This is tricky stuff, right? Like all the provenance of all the tools that go into producing the software you care about also matters. Even if the source code is good, the compiler also has to be right. Make sense? Questions? Maybe the last example of this exact family is uh, software updates is another interesting vector. So separate from how you get the app in the first place, there's also software updates, right? So you install an app and then a long string of updates are gonna arrive on your phone. Even if the app was good to begin with, how do you know the updates are good? And usually the answer for what updates actually get installed is that it has to be an update that was signed by the same developer key that shipped you the app in the first place. But that doesn't really mean much in terms of what you should trust the app to do. So a common thing actually is, uh, this is not an iPhone apps, but Chrome extensions. Uh, there's been a, quite a flurry of activity of bad guys finding popular Chrome extensions that run in your browser and then paying the developer to sell them the app, the, the, or the Chrome extension. And many of these Chrome extensions are like free things you never really cared about. Someone tells you, hey, I'll give you $10,000 for this Chrome extension. And many developers are fantastic. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. Yeah. It's... And then the bad guy deploys an update. And now this extension is not a spell checker or whatever you wanted, but mines cryptocurrency or you know, steals your passwords now. So the update is another place where you really have to worry about whether you want to run the new code that's arriving on your device to the extent that one needing to trust that code was a part of your security plan to begin with. But anyway, these are sort of things that you really should think about in your threat model, and people have gotten it wrong. Many examples, not just in these three cases. Questions about this stuff? Other things you worry about in threat models? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess you're referring, there was this fantastic paper, Reflection on Trusting Trust, that all you guys, I think, in 6033 that have taken it have probably seen. Uh, I guess maybe the grad students haven't seen maybe the paper, or maybe you have. Uh, that's a fantastic paper and really food for thought, right? Like, so if someone might backdoor your compiler in a way that not only corrupts the app you're compiling, but even if you compile the compiler itself, it'll perpetuate the bug forever. I don't think there's, uh, there's some people working on this stuff with, you know, using many compilers to compile each other. But fundamentally, there's no real satisfying answer. Fundamentally, you're screwed uh, <laughs> in the worst case. Uh, but I think, I don't know, just empirically from like learning about actual attacks that have happened, I don't think I know of any attack that has really sort of been mounted in quite that style. Xcode is the closest I know about. I think it's really hard to pull these attacks off. And part of this is maybe a statement about how bad security is, that there's always lower hanging fruits than mounting fancy compiler attacks. Maybe if we get to the point where we worry about reflection on trusting trust style attacks, maybe we should treat that as a success story for security, that like, man, you really have to backdoor a compiler to really compromise security of systems these days. We're so far from there that people haven't really spent a whole lot of energy on that particular angle yet. Plus there are sort of other ways you could do it. You could just like make sure you actually trust the software developer and talk to them and get the source code or a binary. It's not perfect, of course, but uh, yeah. Question? Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is that people have actually built up whole dictionaries, taxonomies, lists, spreadsheets of all kinds of attacks, and there's, they number them from one to 755, and uh, there's like, I don't know. 
it's good that someone's thinking about the stuff. It always feels very bureaucratic and unsatisfactory. I've, I've looked at some of these things. They, they, I guess if you've never seen these things before, it's worth l looking through it. And if there's something you don't know about, maybe it's worth reading and say, oh, well, that's a clever thing that an attacker might do. It's worth sort of expanding your sort of set of attacks you might worry about as like a check, check mark exercise. I don't think it's super productive. If you didn't know about it, it's not like the checklist is going to force you to realize that maybe, I don't know. Um, they, people do try to, very well-intentioned and smart people do try to spend a lot of time on trying to organize this whole threat model thing into much more well-defined categories. And I think to, to some extent, they're, they're useful exercises. But I think if you take it to the, this extreme thing where there's like CWE1 versus two CWE755 or whatever it is, there's 755 of these things. Once there's more than 50, you, you've surely gone wrong somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, question back there. Yeah, so it's an interesting question of like, you know, open source, should I use open source software or closed source things? So I think there's many parts of this. So I think one part of the answer is you should be really wary of this point that closed source software has some tendency, like not always, but there's a bit of a tendency for closed source software to fall back on some obscurity claim. And that's a dangerous thing to, you should really understand why this thing you're using is secure. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that when you're using a piece of software as part of your security plan, sort of, it's your problem if it breaks. It's not someone else's problem. It's unlikely that someone's going to give you money because their software broke and caused your security problem. So regardless of whether the software is open source or closed source, it's up to you to understand how to use it correctly. And in that regard, I think you have to look at a lot of things, like how well maintained is the software? How clean is the abstraction? Like, Many open source projects spend a lot of time making sure that they're very clean and well designed. That's great for security because as we'll see, lots of bugs from messy code and messy interfaces lead to security problems. But at the same time, software has to be maintained. And if this open source package hasn't been maintained in five years, well, that might be a separate kind of problem. So I think it's, there's many issues and some of these issues are correlated with whether something is open source or closed source. But I think it's much more nuanced. There's many dimensions that you might worry about there uh, rather than, sort of, anyway. But this is an interesting, like, so certainly this comes up. If you're engineering a system, you worry about dependencies in general. And then who's going to maintain it? Who's going to fix it? Why should you trust it? Et cetera. Provenance. Ah, provenance. Yeah, Kevin, thanks for the anonymous question. Uh, provenance is usually sort of this notion of where something comes from and then where did that come from, etc. So provenance is I got my, you know, Arch Linux from archlinux.org and... That was a website set up by some other guy. Actually, maybe I'd know them and maybe not. They got the copy of the kernel from some other website. So the question is like, where does all this stuff come from and why are we trusting it? And at each hop, you might worry that bad things are inter introduced potentially. So provenance is sort of loosely referring to understanding or worrying about all the ways that software or systems you're using have gotten to you whether all those hops are good. Make sense? All right, so what do we do about threat models? So what to do? So as I sort of answered in, I think, response to one of the questions, I think you really have to be explicit. So that's one value of a threat model is that it maybe forces you to spell out what is exactly the set of assumptions that my system is depending on, and maybe that'll clarify some weaknesses. Maybe you'll realize that, ah, well, I'm assuming that, I don't know, four digits of credit card number are secure. Maybe that's not a good assumption, etc. So being explicit helps. I think another thing is really being simple and general is good because the fewer assumptions you make, the better. And this goes hand in hand with system design to some extent. Many system designs that we'll look at are good because they allow you to have much more broad assumptions. You don't have to assume that something is 
trustworthy, the system design will actually fix that for you. So to the extent that you can build designs with more general threat models, that's fantastic. And maybe the last point here is sort of a, you know, sometimes called defense in depth. It's unlikely that any one threat model is exactly right, partly because there's lots of attackers and different attackers are different. So it's worth keeping in mind that maybe you should have a bunch of threat models. And with one threat model, you can defend this. With a different threat model, you get better security or worse security. But it's worth thinking maybe of threat models as not being a single thing, that like either I'm all great and this threat model is holding, or something failed in this threat model and my world's collapsed. It's much better to understand maybe sort of various security goals you might have and the associated threat models under which you can defend them. So it's maybe in real systems, it's worth having several layers of this stuff. I think defense in depth is usually the buzzword under which this stuff shows up. Make sense? Questions? All right. So the last category I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is bugs. And uh, in some sense, it's the most tangible place where security failures happen. So bugs, you read a lot about security failures because of some vulnerability here or there. The number to keep in mind is roughly, you'll have one bug in every thousand lines of code. That's a very crude measure, but I think by and large, approximately right. And the thing that's maybe most surprising is that, well, of course you could have bugs in the code that implements policy. That would be disastrous, of course. But the thing that's surprising is that as you start digging into case studies and systems, you'll realize that actually bugs in almost any, any component can lead to exploits. So a pretty good mental model to have is that any bug is bad. Unless you have carefully constructed some plan for making sure that bugs in a certain component don't matter, they probably will matter. And we'll look at a bunch of techniques actually in the first half of this class for how to design systems in a way that prevent bugs from mattering. We isolate the buggy stuff in one box and then it can't affect or damage the rest of the system. That's a fantastic design plan, but you have to actually design it that way and implement it that way. Otherwise, all kinds of bugs that you might not think are security critical will actually lead to security problems. So maybe the most simple example of that to keep in mind is repeated checks. Whenever you're asking someone to implement lots of checks, you're gonna get this wrong. A good example of this was Apple's iCloud service, which I guess makes a repeat appearance in this lecture. Um, so Apple iCloud, that's a large thing. I mean, it's got lots of services. It's got photo sharing, it's got files, emails, etc. And uh, the policy they wanted to implement was uh, related to password guesses. So they were worried that users were choosing bad passwords. And they wanted to make sure that you couldn't try to guess anyone's password more than 20 times, let's say. Otherwise, I could probably guess lots of passwords if I can make a million guesses. So the policy was rate limit passwords or password guess attempts. And the implementation they chose was every service in iCloud had to implement this thing. The photo service, the file service, the email service had to implement this. And they forgot it in one place, which was the find my iPhone application. So everything was great, but if I wanted to guess someone's password, I would just make a million guesses using the find my iPhone interface. That did not throttle the guessing and allowed me to guess, not me, but some attacker, uh, lots of weak passwords. So that's important to have a plan in mind for making your implementation really reliable and really bug free. Otherwise, it's gonna be problematic. Make sense? Question. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the one bug per thousand lines of code is exactly a statement that the less code you have, the better for security. 
And uh, we'll look at various ways to shrink this code and to trust less code that matters. It's not every thousand lines. It's thousand lines of code that you actually need to trust. Maybe you can trust shrink that set. That's a huge win to the extent that you can design your system to have that property. Absolutely. Question back there? Oh, yeah, man. Software engineering is just fantastic. The, to the extent you can do better software engineering, you'll have better software and fewer bugs and more security. That's all great. So in some ways, security is just a, one particular projection of good software engineering. And there's other aspects of security. But in terms of bugs, I think many of software engineering practices go hand in hand with writing more secure software. So we're sort of running out of time. So I'm not going to show some demo. But roughly speaking, the plan for the rest of this class is going to be twofold. There's papers. As I mentioned, every lecture, there's a paper. Read ahead of time and submit your reading questions online before lecture. And then there's five labs. And the labs are going to look at attacks. So you're going to look at buffer overflows in the first lab. Then you're going to look at how to design software to privilege separated in the second lab, et cetera. And those will give you some hands-on experience. So that's roughly the plan. Any questions, post them on Piazza. See you guys on Thursday. Oh, yeah, we'll figure out some plan for office hours and post them on Piazza as well. See you guys then.